<laughs> All right, I want to continue in our series this morning. We're talking about 3D living, the three dimensions of, of living in the kingdom of God. And, and I want to start with a story that I read out of one of Max Licato's books. This is from his book, A Cure for the Common Life. He says, tucked away in the cedar chest of my memory is the image of a robust and rather rotund children's Bible class teacher in a small West Texas church. She wore black glasses that peaked on the corners like a masquerade mask. Silver streaked through her hair like a vein on the wall of a mine. Try to picture this in your, in your imagination. She smelled like my mom's makeup and smiled like a kid on Christmas when she saw us coming to her class. Low-heeled shoes contained her thick ankles, but nothing contained her great passion. Hugs as we entered and hugs as we left. She knew all six of us by name and made class so much fun that we'd rather miss the ice cream truck than Sunday school. Here's why I tell you about her. She enjoyed giving us each a can of crayons and a sketch of Jesus torn from a coloring book. We each had our own can, mind you, reassigned from the cupboard duty to the classroom. We had what held peaches before, or spinach now held a dozen of colored crayons or Crayolas. Take the crayons I gave you, she would instruct, and color Jesus. And so we would. We didn't illustrate pictures of ourselves. We colored the Son of God. We didn't pirate crayons from other cans. We used what she gave us, and this was the fun of it. Do the best you can with what you get, with the can you get, she would say. No blue for the sky, make it purple. If Jesus' hair is blonde instead of brown, the teacher won't mind. She loaded the can. God make you lo likewise. He loaded your can. He made you unique. But no, what he gave you is not enough. You need to understand why he gave it to you so you could illustrate Jesus. Make a big deal out of him. Beautify his face. Adorn his image. Color Christ with the crayons that God gave you. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Last week we talked about in 3D living that kingdom living is three-dimensional living. It's, it's a more exciting life then what you're going to have, in regular life, you're going to have two-dimensional living. You can live a good life. But, but kingdom living is three-dimensional. It pops out at you. There are things that, that my wife and I have experienced that we would have never experienced in our lives if it hadn't been for living for Jesus. We, we've done some exciting things in our lives, and I never envisioned whatever happened in our worlds but because we're following Jesus, he's brought us into some really, really neat things. Now, we've had our downturns. We've had our struggles like all of you. But, but there have been times of such intense joy and, and exciting things and, and stretching things that I would never do. I, if I were left to myself, would never leave American soil. I love clean bathrooms and my tempur bed. Boy, I love my Tempur-Pedic bed. Boy, do I love that thing. It's high on the list. It's not up there, but, you know, it's God and Patty and then my Tempur-Pedic maybe. And then Caleb and Kyle. I don't like dust. I, I don't like foreign food. Some of my friends tease. I got a low man's diet. I like Burger King and Chick-fil-A and... I'm not a real fancy guy, and so when I travel, I, I, I struggle with eating things. But some of the most exciting things have happened in my life because I've gotten outside that comfort zone, just following Jesus, doing his will. And that's what three-dimensional living is. God wants to bring some things that, that you really, really like into your life, and God's going to stretch you some areas, but he wants life to pop out. He wants you to be able to wake up and say, man, I want to do this again tomorrow. One of my favorite lines in the first Incredible movies, when the, well, after at the end, when they're driving in the limousine, so if you haven't seen the movie, that's your homework, go watch The Incredibles, the first one, and the second one's pretty good too, but the first one's better. The young little kid that runs real fast, what's the little kid's name, anybody remember? Dash, Dash, you know, Dash, you know, they're having all kinds of family issues because they're trying to hide his gifts from him in the way that God made him, so to speak. And at the end of the movie, he falls back and says, oh, I love this family, it's my favorite line in the whole movie, and that's what God wants for his people. He wants us to, to fall back and say, oh, I love this family. I love this people. I love this church. I love serving God because serving God and doing his will is not what we've made it out to be. Yes, there's some things you have to deny. Yes, there's some things you can't do. 
And we talked about that last week. We said the dimension of God. God's kingdom is the place three things come together, the place where God's will is done. We follow his commandments. And there are some things that God says, don't do that because it'll hurt you. It's not good for you. Don't do that. But there's not a lot, but there are some. And people struggle with that. And then some religious people add to the commandments. They say things like, you can't watch the Dallas Cowboys on Sundays. That's religious. Because God watches them. That's why their roof opens. So God can look down on them. That's religion. You can watch the Eagles too. God watches the Eagles. He loves all the teams. He loves Cowboys more, but he loves the Eagles too. And so we don't want to pigeonhole God's will to always be something you hate. But there are some things that we have to stress. There's some things that God really says that aren't good for you, so don't do them. And we talked about doing God's will. Then we talked about the place where God's grace is manifest in your life, where there's things where God will get in a groove and, and his grace, he'll begin to work with you. And it can be so gentle sometimes, kind of like Samson. When Samson in the Bible, it says when, when, the, when Samson lost his anointing because he played with it, he didn't even know it was gone. That's how gentle the presence of God can be. It's, it, you've got to really work and to learn to be sensitive to his presence because there's times he'll show up and if you'll just take a few minutes, you'll begin to see there's a grace flowing out of you. We talked about that. Then we talked about his presence, the place where his face is seen. This morning I want to talk to you about how to discover God's will for your life or start to discover God's will for your life. In my life, I was telling somebody just recently when it comes to the will of God, this is how my God has operated in my life. Some of you guys might get, some, might get a burning bush. Some of you might get an angel Gabriel, uh, but I never have. I never had God show up and say, Bob, Bob, you are called to preach. Bob, dude, you're handsome. I don't get that one either. Bob, you're skinny. He used to say that when I was younger. He doesn't say that anymore. <laughs> Folks, I've never had a divine call where an angel shows up. But I know I'm called. I know I'm called to preach because I know it's God's will for my life. Well, how do I know? Well, there's some things that, that, that I could share. But I, I want to share a few things to get you started. Because one of the things that I have found in my life is that when God's beginning to, to, to direct me into, into his will... He usually starts with a north star. I usually find out where north is. Somehow he'll get my attention that where I'm going this way, I need to now go this way, and I don't have all the directions. I don't have a GPS. I don't have a map. I don't know how to go from here to there. I just know where there the direction is. So I turn my life, and I begin to go that way. And as I go, it clarifies. It begins to get clear. And it's a lot like a funnel. Everybody knows what a funnel is. Picture a big, giant funnel. When it comes to the will of God, the top is really broad, can you guys see that? I tried to do this last night in front of everybody, and I just had to practice 10 times so you could read it. But at the top, it's very broad. And this is where we ended really last week with the will of God, that we do his commandments. We, we follow Jesus. We, we make a commitment to follow him as Lord and Savior. We, we begin to do his commandments, and that's the broad will of God. If you will follow Jesus and do his commandments, you'll always be in the will of God. He'll always be happy with you. Now, he loves you, but he's not always happy with us. You know what I mean by that? You know, I love my kids, but I'm not always happy with them. Most of the times I'm happy with them, but, you know, when things happen and they don't do what you think they should, you're not happy with them, but you love them. And God always loves us, but sometimes we do some things and he says, look, you ought not do that. But if you'll do God's will and do his commandments, you'll always be in God's will. But there are other things that begin to help us to discover God's will because most of us are not going to get an angelic visitation. Now, some of you might. I've met people that have, but very few over the 25 years of full-time ministry has anybody come into me and said, Pastor Bob, I had this kind of encounter. I absolutely know God's will. Very few times. And so how do we discover God's will? We look at five things to begin with. Number one is purpose. What is God? Everybody wants to know that they have purpose. I have never met a purpose person that has said, I really hope I, I have no purpose in life. 
And one of the things like battery acid on our souls is some of the beliefs in our society that are saying that we are just cosmic accidents, that there's no reason for us, that we we're just showed up because of chance mutations and all these things. And that is a very spiritual thing, even though I can address the science of it, there is a very philosophical reality to that teaching and a very spiritual aspect of that teaching, which if you take a group of people and tell them constantly there's no purpose for their lives, there's no reason, you're just an accident, they'll begin to act like it. And that's what you're seeing when you go out these doors. Whereas God says in Genesis 1.26 that he made you on purpose, he made you for purpose, he made you with purpose. When God said, let's make man in our image and in our likeness. Let him make, let's like man, let make man like us. God says his purpose for us is to bear his image. You and I, our purpose in life is to color the picture of Jesus. It's to color the picture of God. You and I were created to make God visible. That's your number one purpose in life. This teacher gave them a, a picture of Jesus and they had to color it. And that's what God did when he created us. One writer says that mankind was made to represent God to all other creatures of the earth. That's why God made you. Now, how do we reflect God to people? Because not everybody is reflecting God now. Because in Genesis chapter 3 says that Adam and Eve were given one commandment in the garden. And that was really about who was going to be boss. Who was going to be Lord. Who was going to really be God. Because in a sense, God made us in his image and in likeness. We were like, well, I don't want to say that because people misquote me. But I'll say it anyway. Because <laughs> I'm going to tell you in a minute, you got to love me. We were like little gods. Even Jesus said it in John. When the animals saw us, they said, boy, that person looks a lot like God. But what happened is, is the devil came along and said, not only are you in the image of God, you can be God's and you can take his place. And that's where all the problems started. And what began to happen is man's, the image of God and man began to get marred by a thing called sin. Sin destroys the image of God in us. Sin hides what God, his image that he's put in us that we're supposed to reflect to one another. So instead of reflecting God and who he is, we begin to reflect other things. And the image that God put in every human being of himself begins to get tarnished and distorted and broken. It's like the movie or the book. I prefer the movie. The picture of Dorian Gray. Dorian makes a, makes a deal with the devil. He gets to live forever. Nothing he does will ever, he'll never age again. He'll, he'll be a perfect human being forever. But the devil says, now here's the deal. Every bad deed you do will eventually show up on a picture of him. And so he has this, this portrait of himself. And every time he says a bad thing, every time he does a bad thing, slowly that image of who he is begins to get distorted and marred. Until finally, at, by the end of the movie, it's just hideous. And yet, if when you look at the man, he looks the same as he did 100 years before. That's what sin does to us. That's what sin did to Adam and Eve. It begins to distort the image of God so the true image of who we represent can no longer be seen. And so Jesus Christ came to the earth. What did Jesus come for? Yes, he came to forgive our sins, but he came for much more. He came to restore the image of God to his people. He came to wash away all the ugliness, all the sin, all the things that hide who we truly are. He came to wash them by the cross so that he could restore the image of God to us. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 12, when talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, it talks about the manifestation of the Spirit being given according to the will of God. The manifestation means to make God visible. When the gifts of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, healing and prophecy, and those things begin to work in a body, they're supposed to, they're supposed to make God visible. Then people turn that into all kinds of religious stuff. I've been on all the spectrums of this stuff. I've got experiences with all these things. And I've watched people get religious. Religiosity does not reflect who God is. But God wants to make himself visible through you. He wants you to color Jesus. 
That's your number one purpose. And we do that through a thing called love. Jesus was asked in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. He was asked, he was asked by, the, by the leaders of the church in those days, what are the two greatest commandments? And every one of you probably have heard it. Maybe a few of you haven't. But most of you have heard what Jesus' response is. He said, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. And the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Folks, if we want to make God visible, we have to love God and we have to love one another. That's that simple. What is God's will for you to love one another? I was reading, I'm reading the book of Jeremiah. I'm doing some studies on different things in the Old Testament. I was reading Jeremiah the other day and I was reading some of the other prophets and I began to notice again, be refreshed in my mind, how many times God got aggravated with his people, not because they're worshiping idols, though that did bother him, but because by worshiping idols, how it made them treat one another. They lied to one another. They cheated one another. They, they, they committed sin against one another. And God kept saying through the prophets, don't treat one another this way and don't treat me that way. And it wasn't because God's an ogre. It's because God loves people. Every one of you are his children. And every one of you he loves. Now, not everybody's saved in the world, but, but everybody still bears the image of God. I was saying last night, the reason why murder is a crime in God's eyes is because every human being bears the image of God and every human being has dignity. I don't care how powerful you are on the earth. I don't care how much money you have or how much money you don't have or how much power you don't have or how much prestige you have or how many talents you don't have. Every human being has inherent value because you bear the image of God. You're valuable. And when people hurt that image in you, they're hurting God. So the first thing is to look for your purpose in life. Your purpose in life is to color Jesus by loving one another, by loving God. Lord, I love you. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I'm going to do what you want. I'm going to please you. I walk around the house sometimes praying, just saying, Lord, I just, I just want to make you happy. I just want to please you. Now, I struggle with sometimes wanting to please me. Don't look at me so spiritual there. But I begin to bring my will in line with his. I say, Lord, I want to make you happy above myself. What do you want? Sometimes it takes some time because there's sometimes I want to do my will. Anybody relate to that? I want to do what I want to do. And I'm learning as I get older. The quicker I get over that, the easier my life goes. But God... He loves you, and his number one will is for you to love him and to love one another. The second thing, now here's what I want you to see, that finding the will of God is like this funnel. It goes in broad at the top, but comes out narrow at the bottom. We start with his commandments. We begin to look at the purpose to love one another, but there's, there's also purpose that God has for your life, a specific purpose. Like, I know that I was created to expound God's word. I know that. I know that because... My passion, which is the second one, is to study the Word of God. I, I, I took a nap because we had the, the, the breakfast yesterday, and I stayed up late Friday night, and I don't usually stay up late. Usually my wife stays up later than I do, and, and I go to bed. I'll go to bed around 10. My wife will roll in about 11, and I was telling them last night, that's the secret to a great marriage. But I'm not going to say anything else because my wife began to get nervous and make eyes. But I was tired, so I got up, you know, Saturday morning to go to the men's breakfast. So after I came home from the breakfast, I, I, I took a little nap. And as soon as I got up, the first thing I did was start studying. Now, how many of you, when you get up in the morning, first thing you want to do is study? And when I say study, I mean study. Greek, Hebrew, that kind of stuff. I love it. It's my passion, which leads to the second thing. When you want to find God's, once your life is is aligned with God. And this here, here's the myth about God's will, that people believe and have been taught that Christianity teaches that God wants to eliminate your will. He does not. He wants to align it. He wants to align your will with his will. 
Some things we have to deny. The Bible talks about self-denial, but it's talking about works of the flesh. It's talking about sinful things. There are sinful things that the Bible talks about we're not allowed to do for our own good and to honor God. But outside of those things, which I'm not going to talk about this morning, outside of those things, when we align our will with God's, when we, we start saying, like I was saying, Lord, whatever you want, I want to do what you want. I want to do what you want. I want to do what you want. Like, like for instance, I, I had been reluctant to go on another mission trip because I was tired out by the last one. I got very sick on the last mission trip. And so my flesh was saying, I don't want to go on another mission trip. I don't want to have to take that malaria medicine. And so I took a little break and I began to pray about it. And I began to pray about it. I began to pray about it. And I heard the Lord whisper that he wants me to do another mission trip. And I'm like, oh, I really don't want to do another one. All right, Lord, I'll please you. I'll do what you want, not what I want. Now I have a peace and I know I'm in God's will in that area. What's your passion? We tend to think that God will have you doing something that you absolutely hate. That's the, that's the theology I came up with. And when I was a younger man, now we kept hearing that if it's God's will, it's going to be hard and difficult and you ain't going to like it. And, and I struggled with that because there was a lot of things that I wanted to do, like preach the gospel, teach Sunday school, run a church. And I'm thinking it must not be God's will because I really want to do that stuff. And how wrong that theology was. What he wanted to do was hook it, get that God's will to be first and then align it. Because once you begin to line, the funnel begins to narrow. There's a passion. You have passions in your life. I can prove this theologically. Take the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul became the greatest missionary the church has ever seen. What was the Apostle Paul doing before he got saved? Can anybody tell me? He was persecuting Christians, right? What did the Apostle Paul do? He was missionary. Wasn't he a missionary? Wasn't he traveling other places for God? So we call him missionary. He would, he would go to, to different cities and he would find people that were blaspheming God. He thought Christianity was blasphemous. And so he would go out for God and get those people, arrest them and bring them back to Jerusalem. He was a missionary for God before he even knew Jesus. You know, people can be doing God's will for their lives without even knowing him. But here's what happens when that happens. Because he wasn't aligned with Christ, because he wasn't submitted to Christ, he was killing people. He, the thing that God made him to do was distorted. It was marred. He was Dorian Gray. So when Jesus Christ met him on the road to Damascus, he says, who are you, Lord? And he bends his knee to Jesus, and Jesus becomes Lord. And then the purpose God had for his life and the passion he put in for him, he began to use that passion to direct his life. Because Paul says this in Romans 15. 19. He said, I have made it my aim, my purpose, to preach the gospel not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. What Paul's saying is that when Jesus got a hold of him, what Jesus did not do was suck out <laughs> all his passion. Instead, he hitched it to God's will. And he began to direct them to the passion. What are you passionate about? What do you love to do? What bubbles out of your mind? What's the first thing that comes up to you when you get up in the morning? What is the first thing you want to do? There's a lot of things that we do because we have to do. I'm into exercising now, and I'm really trying to lose weight, and I'm going to the next season of my life, and I'm trying to figure out how to, to really stay in shape and have the energy. And so I hate exercising. Can anybody say that, amen with me? I hate exercising, but it's something I've got to do. I don't wake up in the morning, oh, man, I get to do planks this morning. Oh, I'm so happy. Praise Jesus. But I wake up thinking, oh, we got donuts for breakfast this morning. We got healthy cereal with 14 grams of sugar. No, I've cut, I've cut cereal out. I'm really working on this thing, not because I want to. I enjoy eating. Some people eat to live. Some people live to eat. I'm one of those live to eat guys. I love to eat. I worship every time. Like, thank you, Jesus, for this Chick-fil-A sandwich. <laughs> God doesn't suck the passion out of you. He uses that passion in your life. It's part of God's will for you. I can't think of anybody in the Bible that was used mightily by God that didn't have a passion for what they were doing. Now, they struggled with it. Jeremiah said, man, would you stop talking to me, God? I'm tired. He said, but then your word was like a fire in my bones. That's called passion. What's your passion? What's important to you? 
What angers you? Watch, watch the news for a week. You want to find your passion? Watch the news for a week and see what ticks you off. I have a lot of passions. One of the things I've noticed recently, and I began to pray about it, and I think the Lord might be giving me an answer on this. I began to notice that when I watch movies, I cry a lot. Now, I don't let anybody see it. I'm too manly for that. And I began to say, Lord, you know, I, th- th- this scene will go up and uh, they'll start playing the music and I'll, I'll start crying. You know, a little, little whimper. And feel like tears are coming. And, and, and I began to pray about it and I began to notice a common denominator. It's always when somebody's getting hurt. Or taken advantage of. Or not being treated right. I began to realize it's a real passion of mine, but I had to become aware of it. I had to begin to say, you know, I'm really, I really, when I hurt your feelings, if I ever hurt your feelings, folks, because I can do that. I, I, I'm a bull in a china shop sometimes, and I hurt people's feelings, and, I, and, I, and it really bothers me when I hurt people's feelings, because I really care. It's a passion of mine. Folks, what are your passions? Start paying attention. What really bothers you? Get your attention. Get your emotions stirred. What are your passions? Not mine. You're not trying to be like me. You See, she gave, the, 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 the teacher gave everybody a can with crayons, and they got different crayons in it, and Jesus wants you to color him with the crayons that he's given you. One of those crayons is your passion, and the other one is your potential. What's up on the board next is your potential. Not everybody gets the same crayons. Not everybody has the same potential. There's potentials you have that I don't have. When it comes to potential on the basketball court, LeBron James and I, we don't have the same crayons in our can. When it comes to football, me and Tom Brady don't have the same crayons. We don't have the same rings. Somebody got me the five bought me five of the Dallas Cowboy rings, Super Bowl rings. Man, they're awesome. But what makes me aggravated is Brady's got six. <laughs> Even when I'm trying to be equal, I can't be equal. What crayons are in your can? You have potential for some things, some things you don't have potential for. When I was 15, I wanted to be a jet pilot, and I began to get my grades good. I began to get straight A's, and I, and I began to, to do the things I had to do, like get elected to Boy State and find out who our state senators were and, and had to get a, a letter of recommendation to the Air Force Academy. And I had that all stuff. I was lining all that up, and I had perfect eyesight. I was 6'1", 130 pounds. You count every rib twice. I was in good shape, played football, and I was headed for the Air Force Academy until I had that first seizure. And that first seizure took all that potential off the board for me. And that was probably worse than the physical things I went through because my whole life was spinning out of control. What does God want? I don't have potential anymore. Now I can't do what I want. And It's interesting that and then even in ministry, I began to meet people that have gifts that I don't have. For about a decade, I'd complain to God about it. Why couldn't you give me that gift? Why couldn't you give me that gift? Why didn't you give me that crayon? Why didn't you give me that crayon? Folks, we can look at other people and say they got crayons we don't have. But God gave you the crayons, and he did not give you certain crayons because the crayons he didn't give you mean it's not your responsibility. Folks, that'll bless you after a while. You're not called to do everything. There's some of the things that you guys don't have a passion for. This is why we're trying to teach an environment of free will, that that we want you to do the things and give to the things and get involved in the things that you have passions for because not everybody is going to have the same passions for everything because God has a will, and that will for your life begins to funnel down from a generalized purpose to to a passion, to potential. There's things God has put in your life. Now, the potential, God's gift to you is your potential. He puts the cans in your, the the Crayolas in your can. But your gift to God is what you do with those crayons. And that might take some work. It might take some education. It might take some practice. 
But you can't do everything, and you got to figure out. I mean, when I was 20 years of age, I was leading worship. I led worship for 10 years. I know how to lead worship. I know how to, I know how to lead people in worship. I know how to sing. I, I have a, a voice. I can carry a tune, and I, I sang much better when I was younger. I could really get up there, man. Now it's, I had to let John carry a few notes last night. Been speaking too long, too many times. But I could have developed that talent. I could have said, you know, I'm going to become a musician. I'm going to become a worship leader, but I didn't have a passion for it. Instead of playing the guitar, I wanted to read the scriptures. Instead of, instead of playing the piano, I wanted to read Greek and Hebrew. Instead of, instead of doing musical things and playing the drums, I, I would get books out that were complicated, encyclopedias, and I'd read encyclopedias. And that's what I did on Friday night for dates till I met Patty. You can't do everything. The average person has 500 abilities. And you're going to have to figure out a few. In fact, I read, I forget who the guy is. He said, he said people can only be experts at three or four things in their lives. It takes 10,000 hours to become an expert at something. If you'll spend 10,000 hours on something, if you have the aptitude, you can become an expert in a field. That's what it takes. People ask me, how do you know what you know in the Bible, Pastor Bob? I've spent well over 10,000 hours in the Bible. I've lived in the Bible since I was 18 years of age. But I can tell you things I can't do. My brother can take a car apart and put it back together. I can take it apart. And I usually have extra parts. But you know what? My brother could do it by just looking at it. One day we were, our rotor tiller stopped working and he couldn't figure it out. He, the, the rotor tiller wasn't working. I said, give me the diagram. And so I read the diagram. I read the instructions and because I could read it in a book. I could read it. I fixed it. Different potentials, different passions. What about you? What are your, what are your abilities? What, are your, what, are your, what is your training? All these things. What do you desire? Because look, folks, this is what we need to know about learning. You will learn a lot more about something that you like than something you don't. What's your passion? What's your potential? There's some things you're going to have to take off the list. And the third, fourth one is place. This one gets forgotten. The last two get forgotten a lot. Where are you supposed to do God's will? These things you ought to be looking at in your life. God, what's my purpose? Why did you create me? Why did you make me? What purpose do I serve? First of all, to love you, to express God's love. But then there's another thing, that God has something specific he wants you to do in life. Some people get clear direction, other people don't. So be careful with all this. Do you look at your passions, what's in your heart? You begin to look at your potential. Well, like my son, my son loves basketball. My son has a head for basketball. I have never met anyone like my son who can look at the basketball court. He'll tell me the ball is going to go there. And we're watching you know, NBA basketball. There goes the ball or college basketball. Like how do you know that? He just knows it. But he's 5'9". And I tried to tell him when he's growing up, dude, you're going to have a hard time making the NBA. You're 5'9". You don't have the potential unless you're Spud Webb who is 5'6", but he wasn't Spud Webb. And nobody knows who that is. Few of you, anybody over 40 knows that everybody else is. Who's Spud Webb? He's just a short guy that made it to the, N to the NBA, but he could jump like six feet in the air. But you know what? My son, his passion is basketball. So you know what he does? Because he has the mind for it, he coaches. We don't all have to be on the basketball court. Some of us are called to do the announcements at the game. Some of us are called the referee. Some of us are called the coach. Folks, there are so many things that we can do with our passions for the kingdom of God. We have to look at our aptitudes, our potential. And then where, where, where do you want me to do it? This is one of the big things in America now. The last two are place and people, and they kind of go together. God's will is not just about you doing the right thing or doing a certain thing. It's about who you do that thing with and where you do that thing. And what's happening in America culture today is that we are less connected than ever because of what sociologists call three types of people. There's three types of people when sociologists look at us in America. They're the people that study our communities. They say there's, there's, there's mobile people. Let me make sure I get this right because this is very important. I don't want to mess this up. There are people called mobile people. They're, they're so mobile 
that they can't get rooted to community. These are people that are moving and leaving, going from one place to another, and it's hard to get rooted in community in a people or a place when you're moving all the time, and some, that's a little bit of a struggle because of, of the nature of our, of, our, of our society today. The second one is the people that are stuck. These are people that can't afford to get rooted in community because of one crisis or another, and then there's what they call the rooted, who they say are a shrinking number of people who choose to embrace the joys of thick community in a particular place. Which are you? Mobile, stuck, or rooted? I am convinced that the church in America is on the threshold of a move of God, but I hesitate to say that because when I say that, people get all these visions of what it looks like. But one of the moves that we need is to get rooted and connected with flesh and blood relationships again. Because, look, I'm all for using technology, but there's nothing that replaces being in person with people. There's nothing that replaces being in the physical presence. I don't know why, because I've enjoyed being Skyped and, and being on the internet with people and talking to them from halfway around the world. That's an exciting thing, but there's still something about being with them. And God has a place for you. Pastor Bill, our founding pastor, used to say to me, from time to time. He would say, Bob, he said, there is the things that I've done here that the Lord has blessed may not have worked somewhere else. He said, this is my place. He said, people have to find their place. And he's absolutely right. There is a place where God's grace, I said this last week, will show up in your life. And there's a place that grace might not show up in your life. So we have to start praying more about it. I'm not saying get rigidly fearful that if you're going to take a job somewhere that you're getting out of God's Well, please don't hear that. I'm just, I mean, I met somebody recently that told me that they had a passion and they're going to get a chance to get a job in another state. And I'm so thrilled for them because I could see the funnel lining up. This person had been wanting to do a certain career their whole lives. They've been moving that direction and now they're going to have to move. And I'm like, I'm applauding it. They're going to get located in a place where that thing that they do can become a reality. And I think, and as I just said, one more thing you need to do is make sure when you get there is that you get a people. Because you can go to the right place. But folks, we need a people. We need a community. A community has multiple layers. There's big community. This is big community. Everybody needs to be part of something bigger than themselves. Why? Because we get big in our britches if we're in a small, you can be a big fish in a small pond. I remember being in high school, I was a big fish in a small pond. I was class president. Proud was a peacock. Well, I was president. I, I got in both in both my junior and senior years. I was class president. Prom night in eleventh grade, I got to walk in with my date second. And prom night in my senior year, I got to walk out first. There was only ninety six people in my class. My wife went to school with Oral Hershiser, the, the pitcher. She, he was a year older than her. He had me fifteen hundred in your class, eight hundred in your class. Now, folks, if I was class president in that, I was somebody. But 96 people, they went to the bottom of the barrel and said, look, we need somebody to do this. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, that's why we need a bigger community. There's a big community in the church. We're part of a 2 billion people community. You need to be part of a local community where it's bigger. Then there's smaller communities, groups of 12, where we have uh, what we call a life group or a small group. We have people that we have certain connections with. And then we have groups of three where we have friendships with three or four people. I call it four to carry your mat where, where you can call them in the middle of the night when you have a need or they can call you or when you go on vacation, you watch their kids, they watch your kids and all those kind of things. That, and then you have, can have one particular close friend. Folks, that's healthy community. I'm trying to get everybody that because I believe that's what God is saying right now to the church in America. People need community, and we've been hurt in community. We've been wounded in community. We've been disappointed with each other. We've all done things or failed to do things. We've said things or, or not said things, and, and we've hurt one another, and we've got to shake off this hurt if we're going to find God's will for our lives. Now, you can go to heaven without all this stuff, but folks, you may want to get there early. I believe we live well below what God has for us. 
There is nothing like it. I have people in my life who have taken bullets for me. Do you? But here's the catch. I'll take a bullet for them. That's the kind of church I want to build here. That's God's will. Do we always get along? Nope. Are we different temperaments? Yep. You ought to be in a meeting with me. I ain't the easiest person to get along with. I may be loving, but folks, I'm a bull in a china shop, man. I'm like, let's get her done. Hardest thing in my life than Eagle's Nest has been to, to wait on God. Okay, next step, Lord, when are you going to get going? Come on, Lord. It's the first time in my life that I feel God saying, you better keep up with me now. God wants you to know his will. But don't over-spiritualize it. If he gives you an angelic visitation, let me know so I can test it. Make sure it's an angel and not pizza. <laughs> There's ways to test those things. But I've met people, they really have had visitations and things. So don't, don't throw that out. But folks, you could wait for 30 years and not get one. What do you do? You start looking at these things. What do you want to commit your life to? What three or four things are your purpose? I'm narrowing it down in my life. I'm seeing the end now. I'm 55 years old. I'm saying I might have 30 good years, 25 good years, 20 good years. I don't know. I've committed the next 20 years of my life to you. You are my people. What makes a people? A people or a group of people. Or what makes a people is a group of people that share a common love or loyalty or value. That there's something that brings us together and we share that thing. And secondly, a people is a people, and this is found in the book of Exodus. You can read this on your own time. Exodus 32, 9 through 11. I have a lot more scripture in here, by the way. Every one of these things is scriptural, but I've run out of time and my memory fails me sometimes when I'm speaking. But Exodus 32, 9, you'll read a story when, when Moses got the Ten Commandments. He went up, up to Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, and at the end of that time, God says, Moses, you need to go down and check out your people because they've already corrupted themselves and they've forsaken me. He's up there getting a ten. He's getting the tablets they haven't, he hasn't come down yet, and they're already forsaking God. And, and Moses goes down, and he gets mad, and he, he, he throws the tablets down. And then God says, in Exodus 32, 9, God says, Moses, get out of my way and let me just deal with these people. I'm going to wipe them out. Wow. And then he says this, Moses, I, I, I'll, I'll make a people of you. Now, we're going to deal with difficult, I'm going to do a whole series later on around May on difficult things in the Bible. These are, these are difficult things. I'm going to explain some of these things. And what, what's the point of all that? And what, how do we make sense of that? But just hang with me this morning and put that on the calendar for May. Moses says, God, don't do that. And Moses intercedes for his people. And I want you to know this about Moses. Moses could have got a promotion. Moses could have been promoted from just a guy that has to put for, for a year at least. Moses has been dealing with people that have been nothing but complain about his leadership. They've whined, they've moped, they've groaned, they've grumbled, they've complained, they want to throw him off a bridge, so to speak. And now here he is, God's having a bad day. And he's talking God down. He's saying, God, don't, you don't want to do that. Please don't do that. And here's how you know you have a people. When you have a people, you'll give up opportunities for their good. If tomorrow somebody came in here and landed and said, Pastor Bob, we'll pay you $200,000 a year to lead this Bible college, You'll work two days a week, you'll have a BMW, a Spence account, and your wife will get pedicures, manicures, whatever they call those things, three times a week, I'd say, sign me up. No, I wouldn't say, I can't do it. These are my people. It doesn't matter what opportunities come now for me, because you're my people. Unless the Lord tells me I was wrong on this commitment, and I always leave room to be wrong, I'm going to be here the rest of my life. You're my people. 
Folks, I can't tell you how good that feels. And I want it for you. It's God's will. Stand with me. God's finding God's will. I wish I could say that I always knew God's will for you and for people. I don't. I start with north and I say, Lord, okay, I'm going north. What's the next steps? Look at these things. Pray about these things. Begin to, begin to just pay attention to who God is, what the scripture says, and who you are. And get out of the trap that God wants to annihilate your will. That's Buddhism. That's not Christianity. If you're submitted to Christ and he's Lord and you're saying, Lord, I want to make you happy. Start paying attention to those things that stir your heart. Because it might just be that God has direction for you. Father, my words are inadequate to communicate concepts that are so deep like this. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit would take things that have been said this morning and spread them out and anoint them and touch them with every individual. And wherever we are, whether, Lord, we're struggling to love one another or whether, Lord, we're trying to figure out what our passion is because not everybody's as passionate as I am, so it's very easy for me, but not for them. There's others, Lord, that they have potential and they've not really looked at it. They've beaten themselves down and they, they say, well, I'm not good at this, I'm not good at that. When truthfully, folks, you might be better than they think. And Lord, I pray for them. Father, for everyone to find our place, an area, a region where we can settle down and get rooted. And that, Father, even in our mobility, we'd be able to figure out how to become community again. And Father, for those that might be stuck, that crisis after crisis after crisis hinders them from being able to commit to community and pour in because to get something out, we have to pour something in. My prayer is that you would provide for them to get unstuck. Because, Lord, there is no substitute. If we're going to do your will, it's going to involve people. So help us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen.